Don. Nick, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with, uh, you know, some esteemed colleagues and uh, esteemed brands. Uh, you know, it's funny. I remember as a kid watching uh, the Clydesdales during the Super Bowl, Spuds McKenzie, and then Cindy Crawford doing uh, uh, the first Pepsi commercials in the Super Bowl, and then you know all the iconic halftime shows. So it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's really an honor to to be here talking to some brands that have, you know, not only were dominant early on in sports marketing, but remain very dominant. And I think any time brands could be that strong over that kind of period of time, uh, I think it's pretty amazing. So um, to kick it off, I'd love for, um, you know, each of you to, uh, you know, to talk about what your role is and what you specifically uh, do with, with, with Pepsi. Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go first. I'll jump in. Um, thanks for having me back here. Good to be on. Um, and actually, this is so fortuitous. I don't know if anybody has heard or seen their uh, social feeds, but as we talk about media, we actually just announced today the performer of the Pepsi halftime show, which is the weekend. So breaking news. Uh, it has already been announced just maybe a few hours ago, but that's huge. And I'm sure we'll talk about things like that because that is one of the most massive if not the most massive media platforms we have so justin Toman, i oversee sports uh and sports marketing partnerships for pepsi hey katie sure great uh hi everyone and thank you so much for having me um my name is katie hanafi and i work with justin uh we sit in the same group together but my uh, main responsibility is leading our media strategy and investment for beverages so that includes our csd brands teas coffees waters and energy so i'm super excited to be here and having a great conversation Fantastic. And Nick, I know everybody's met you already, but uh, just in case anybody just jumped in right now, just want to introduce yourself back again. Yeah, it's the Nick Kelly, oversee our sports and entertainment group, uh, as well as just a bunch of other small things. But, you know, oversee a lot of our partnerships across the, the board, almost the exact same job as Justin. So that's why it's nice to be able to compare notes with this group, you know, offline and online. Fantastic. Well, listen, you know, the thing I think is really exciting is in my previous life, before I, I joined the out-of-home business, I was in the sports business working at Madison Square Garden and CBS Sports. And one of the things when I first started at Madison Square Garden, I found to be interesting was how many, um, how many brands would do deals with us and then never activate them, never really do things, especially in media. So they'd say, well, we're going to buy this sign and then nothing ever happened. Now, there's so much more than signage and, and that in, in the sponsorship business now, and sponsorships are very massive. Um, but one of the things I was struck by uh, in speaking early with Justin and, and Katie was how they really integrate together. So I'd love for uh, both of you to speak to that, how you guys kind of bring those two disciplines together in a really cohesive way. Yeah, Katie, I'll, I'll kick it off and um, you can help me out that probably do it more eloquently than I, but I um, I mean, the best partnership is one that you activate, right, John, to your point. Um, does no good if you just sign up and buy a bunch of stuff and sit on it. So the best partnership we say is one that you activate. Um, and I'm, I'm probably way too excited about this analogy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it and you're probably going to laugh. But I, I'll say like media and sports are like peanut butter and jelly, right? Um, they're really good by themselves and you can get a lot of value from each alone. But man, when you put them together, that is when the, the, the special you know sauce comes together um and not only putting them together you get a better result but i think that the the art and science of it all and, and what katie and i spend a lot of time doing together is putting them together in the right ratios right you can't have too much peanut butter or too much jelly otherwise it doesn't quite work but then if you get it right that's when the true synergy is unlocked of both things and, and i think katie would echo that you know we we can can probably touch 70,000 people in a stadium. We can maybe touch a few million in a market in terms of a retail activation setting. But but Katie's world and that media and the content and technology is the true megaphone and the true amplification uh, of everything that we do in sports. So without Katie, I'm uh, you know I'm I'm not really firing on all cylinders. Yeah, and I would just I would so I would totally echo that. And I think you know from a media perspective, sports is so integral to us reaching our consumers. 
So it is important that we leverage and partner together um, through just not media, but also through to the fan experience, right? So, so Justin and I partner together to make sure that everything we do, and frankly, not just the two of us, our teams, I should say, work very well together when activating and understanding what a sports promotion is doing and what media is doing. Um, and, you know, a lot of we all talk to the same people. Right. So they're all owned by the same companies to some extent. So we want to make sure that we're thinking holistically across the board. Um, and it, it, it really is a true team effort. And I think having us together sitting under the same uh, VP, I would say, helps that. Right. Because we all have we're all marching towards the same agenda to connect consumers with our brands. Nick, what does that look like, um, you know, at InBev and, and AB uh, for you guys in terms of that coordination? It's a similar structure. I think the the one difference, I mean, maybe that we, we struggle with sometimes is that we're looking at the, the media planning that goes in place around, you know, that's called the core four properties. But then we also have the media that's tagged to the, the, the team deals. And for the first couple of years I was here, we almost looked at the, the local media and the local media assets independently and what we found is we were either under or overrepresented in the media landscape depending on you know if i had an exclusive radio deal with the chicago cubs plus i was buying incremental national radio and tv you couldn't turn anywhere without real seeing a budweiser ad from chicago that's not necessarily the right mix we wanted but you know the biggest thing we learned is national sponsorship and national media talks really well together the one thing we've been able to accomplish in the last 18 months is bring in the local team deals and the local media deals to now have a total like media picture on a fan as opposed to just a dma so now if i'm if i'm targeting a cubs fan we don't want to have so much frequency that we're wasting money so that's the hard part and i'm sure that these guys are doing it too but the scary part is we haven't been doing it well until very very recently and now we're actually at a point where you know, Paolo, who runs our media team, I mean, they can tell you where every dollar goes and how many times we're hitting a Cubs fan. So that's just maybe the, the biggest thing we're proud of, of working together. And I think that that's really, you know, challenging when you spend as much as we do and Pepsi does on just media alone. There's a lot of dollars out there to make sure you're not wasting any of them. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that probably unlocking that kind of concept, Nick, is probably an age old problem for sports marketers so being able to do that uh you know not having the national deal and then getting you know ambushed by every local deal but then having it all work together spending the money wisely is very important um when you think about national deals uh, i think of uh you know the first place i turn have a lot of friends there is at the nfl and uh i use that as a launching pad um in the start when i talked about you know you know, remembering all the Super Bowls, remembering all those iconic commercials. So love to hear what that kind of coordination, Justin, you and Katie talked about earlier, what that looks like when it's put in practice with the NFL deals. Yeah, it's um, and it extends beyond the NFL to other leagues and, and almost every single team now. And, and we look at the we look at the leagues, all the leagues and all of our team partners now really as media properties unto themselves. When you think about, you know, on one hand, it seems like, oh, how, how could I think about the Dallas Cowboys or the 49ers in the same way I think about NBC or CBS, but they both essentially do something very similar, which is have a massive reach and, and, and you know, able to engage with people consuming their content. So in that way, they are almost one and the same. So we look at all these properties through several lenses, one of which is as media entities. And so we we almost, you know, treat them that way in terms of think about how, how we can leverage their scale to reach people in terms of impressions and engagements. Um, really, I can't, I'm trying to think of any major deal, even some of the mid and even smaller ones now that Katie's team is not at the table. Like I, we just don't negotiate sports deals anymore without media having a really important seat at the table. And I'm thinking of one recent league deal that we went through that um, literally every single point in the process, every single meeting, it was sports plus media and the league all talking because, you know, Katie and her team make us so much smarter about the dollars we spend, whether it's controlled media or a media fund or the media commitments that typically go along with deals. Um, all that is so, so much more efficiently done and coordinated. So we essentially negotiate a platform, whether it's the NBA three point contest or the FCC halftime show, that asset is always negotiated in concert with just hopefully if we do it right, just the right amount of media that is going to optimally amplify that platform. Yep. 
And I would say also on the flip side to that, right? So our media partners like an NBCU or a Warner Media, we have our sports counterparts sitting in those. So when we want to build out a, um, a media marketing partnership, such as uh, you know, the opener for the Sunday night football, like that is uh, coordinated, but it's through a media buy that we're able to secure that stuff. But then we have to bring all of our sports, you know, assets, the power that we have of players and and content development and, and the brand to the table. So I would say it works both ways to make sure that, yes, we're there when the leagues, uh, when Justin's leading through the the league deals, uh, and then on the flip side, they're there when we're we're trying to negotiate, you know, multi-million dollar deals with our NFL schedule and what are the right matchups and then what is the added value or activation that we want to bring to life that makes sense for us. So it works both ways. Mm, absolutely. Nick, how about for you guys? I mean, uh, how how is that how does that work with your partnerships? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because for us is that we have multiple brands that activate some of our partnerships. So if you look at when we do Super Bowl, um, you know, we have, you know, the official seltzer of the NFL, the official beer, the official wine. So you may see three different products trying to leverage both our Super Bowl media buy plus our NFL relationship. So it's a little bit, you know, it's just it's it's a uh, it's a weird balance uh, on our end to try and make everybody feel like they're getting the value of both, which is. The, the Super Bowl spot, which isn't cheap, plus the the NFL uh, piece of it and, and combined. But even outside of that, it's just, you know, what we've learned maybe more so than anything else is that, you know, you can be ambushed uh, by thinking that you buy in the league deal. Now this means that everybody's going to know you're the official and you're going to get that added value. Like there's a lot oftentimes where we've seen that if we don't go out there and support our media partners that are supporting our, our the sports that we're a part of, you know, we've done studies that show our competition are perceived to be the leader in that space because while they don't have any money invested on the sponsorship side, they're heavily invested on the media side. So that's been a big pivot for us. We've benefited from that in the past. You know, for almost a decade, we weren't the weren't the sponsor of NASCAR. But we would spend very heavily uh, in NASCAR around a lot of our brands. And during that period of time, we were always still perceived as the official beer. So like it became one of the things that we still got back into NASCAR. So we saw the value. But if you don't do both, you know, the, the opportunity to leave yourself to be kind of ambushed, uh, it, it puts you in a really tough spot. Katie, I'd love for you to speak to that that point. I think that it really has a lot of relevance to, to, to you as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's 100 percent right. And, and we've done that with with different, um, you know, sports. But. I think what we try to do is we try to focus our efforts. If we're investing in specific sports, um, athletes, talent, uh, we want to try to synergize and not go the other way. And like, listen, we know Coke, they're going to be in the Olympics. We can't buy in the Olympics. Maybe this year's a little different. Who knows? Um, there are certain things we've been just frankly locked up out of, and we don't want to play in that space. And we just say, hey, let them own it. Uh, and then we're going to be smart and make sure that we want to amplify in the sports that we choose that are strategic for us. We're going to try and make sure that the uh, fans know and consumers know that those are the sports that our brands are playing in. Yeah, I think I, I think another point that that I, I was just thinking about as, as you were talking about this and in, in the work with your media partners is, you know, going back 10 years ago, I think there was a perception that the sports marketers were like, the guys with the innovation, the people, you know, men and women who are coming to us with great ideas with brands and the media guys were like a, a bolt on and the creativity wasn't there. Uh, I think what I'm hearing from you guys is that level of creativity from a media standpoint with the media partners, whether it be the league media partners or whether it be the 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 outside, you know, the NBC's, Fox's, CBS's really stepped up its game. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I'm happy and Justin definitely jump in. I think the media partners, and this is something that I we pride ourselves on, we take it one step uh, closer to who's the producer, who's the executive producer of the opener? How do we leverage our relationships to find those creative people that then we can all sit down at the table, brand, sports, media, and say, hey, what is the objective and how can we build something unique and ownable for our brand? Um, and that's something we do in sports and frankly, outside of sports with all of our media partners. It's it's about right trying to get to the right folks uh, and the marketing side and then even on the executive producer side. 
Yeah, and to build on it, I mean, we we I, I use our two some of our most marquee assets at league levels, which is the NBA three the Mountain Dew three point contest, which we love, and and the halftime show with the NFL. Um, in every single discussion every year, you know, each one of those platforms is probably a ten to eleven month planning cycle, right? Right after it happens, you really quickly start planning for the next one, and all the meetings, all the big most important meetings, are with us, the league, in many cases, um, you know, in most cases now the broadcaster, whether it's Turner or, or this Super Bowl, whoever's broadcasting it that year, NBC, CBS, whoever it might be, we all sit down at the table and say, hey, here's, you know, here's the halftime show, right? We just announced today, the weekend, the headlining artist, which is awesome. Um, that all started, you know, in, in April and March. And we sat down with the broadcaster, with the NFL, with Rock Nation, and said, okay, here's, here's the asset, right? Everybody knows that the 12-minute show is kind of the core bullseye of the asset, but it really doesn't do much for us unless we can really amplify it and take it in creative and interesting ways, largely through media, whether that's doing different things during the broadcast of the show or how you announce the partnership, you know, the, the big announcement like we did today, um, whether it's doing, you know, post content, right? Whether it's behind the scenes stuff or a documentary that you release in interesting ways after the show, um, you know, it's social media during the show, right? Leveraging all the different platforms out there, social and digital media to, you know, with the goal of bringing fans and viewers kind of one step closer to the show and what's going on. And maybe even ultimately at some point, giving them some sort of influence over the show, um, which, which has been a kind of a, you know, a North star that we're trying to figure out. Um, but it really, media is the unlock. Again, whether it's traditional linear, or whether it's digital social, um, all of our assets, funny, are so, are, in a way, are so much in a box. And then the media is, is and the innovation and the content, and not nowadays the technology, is really the unlock to get get that asset out of the box and actually give it scale to millions. In the case of you know, the halftime show, hundreds of millions of people. I love what you just said, uh, Justin, about social. Uh, and if I think of any. Uh, any of like kind of the disciplines where it's so crucial to have your media partnerships and your sponsorships working together to really get the full benefit of social, it's uh, it's in social. And uh, I wanted to share something on on my screen right now. Um, this is um, this is something you guys did for the Super Bowl um, in Atlanta uh and how appropriate in atlanta and we see whose town it was when you guys were in atlanta what a cool execution uh out front as one of your partners on this we've utilized this time and time again with brands trying to get them to further activate their sponsorships can you speak to this and then let's dig in a little bit on social yeah katie we can God, I mean, we can tag team this one. That was a that was a fun one. Um, it was really again. I go back to our what I'll call our our anchor activate amplify strategy. And anchor is all about putting our brands at the center of the action in a stadium. Activating is in the market, and then amplifying is taking it much broader. But this this one, your example, John, really was the activation in the market. It was retail. We did a ton of out of home. Every time we go to a Super Bowl city, much like you know um, Budweiser, we're doing a ton of out of home. Make sure eyeballs are present. But when you can get creative with the um, the copy or, or or the messaging, as in this case, I think Katie can speak to that. Really, you know, we leveraged the, the great creative in a location uh, and really amplified it via digital and social. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, the, again, going back to that planning cycle, we knew Atlanta was going to be an interesting one for us, being in our competitors' uh, backyard and. And uh, the brand positioning of, you know, poking the bear, we're, we're always the challenger brand. So the team put a lot of effort on how are we going to activate differently than what we normally do in a Super Bowl market, where we do like to come in and own the city, but own it in a way that is nationally exposed, right? We don't want to just make it for that one city. We want to get PR. We want to get earned. We want people who are living in other cities to be like, oh my gosh, look what Pepsi's doing. Uh, and that was a perfect, like, perfect example of what we did in Atlanta. At a home is, I mean, I love at a home when you have an event like that, like there's nothing better than it. There's digital is great, broadcast is great, but when you're in that market and you're seeing strategic signs everywhere with fun different copy and placement of where you're gonna be, where the NFL, the fan zone is and where the stadium is and when people get off the airport, I mean, that's where media really comes to life. And we when we marry the message to make sure that we're following the consumer where they're gonna be throughout that experience. And the hope is that we get some national PR coverage, which in this case, I think worked out pretty well for us. 
So that's a great example on a national scale of coming in for this big national event and using the out of home to kind of drive this social conversation nationally. So that board just doesn't live in that one location, lives all over. Nick, you guys have done a great job of a similar type of thing when baseball season kicks off in a particular marketplace. I've seen you guys do stuff with some of your partners with the teams where you know, you're buying some really iconic units at the start of the baseball season making sure people know right off the bat hey we're the biggest partner with this particular franchise yeah i think it's important for us too is to pick our moments i mean we don't have, have as much media as, as any of us have we don't have enough to run you know the full season i think that that's why we buy team and league partnerships is to have that constant presence but for some of the more traditional media assets have it be a 30 second tvc a radio spot or even a predominant out of home board that overlooks the stadium is we have to pick the right, the right times of the year. So for us, the most important times of the year, opening day, because it's every they're always gonna sell out. And it's really for us, it's the you know May, June, July, which is the three biggest months for us as a company. So I wanna be mm -hmm. top of mind then. It sounds crazy, but for us, like September, October is great from a national awareness standpoint, but we're not, it's not exactly our highest grossing months from from from, from a beer selling season. So we rather put our, our our scale and our actual activations on the front end of a baseball season. So to your point, we basically run a three month campaign, April, May, June, to let all baseball fans know from the Yankees to the Astros to the Marlins, like, you know, we're here to help welcome baseball season. And baseball season sometimes is seen as kind of the, the kickoff to the summer. And so like for us, it's like we want to be there and start our summer campaign. So it could be using MLB, MLB or Team IP. It could be a combination of that plus summer, uh, which is what we're doing now. But yeah, I mean, I think picking the moments is important. And baseball season is long. Like baseball season is six months. Yeah. It's hard for us to stay relevant. So mm -hmm. doing that, doing all-star in the local market, doing the playoffs, but to do it for 162 games is nearly impossible. And everybody's got a chance on April 1st. So even the Mets. So that's Wrong great. Place. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, Justin, you mentioned something to me that I thought was really awesome uh, when you were talking about what you guys did on a, on a uh, was kind of a local basis, but it, it became <laughs> national um, around um, uh, something you did with the Bills and uh, the fan uh, up in Buffalo. I thought this was a crazy great story. I'd love for you to share it with the group. Yeah, it's um, and, and Katie, we can again tag team. It was um, it's a really fun case study, and and it started on social. You know, it started with us like us finding out that this local fan uh, based out of Rochester, uh, New York, big Bills fan, had painted the side of his garage um, with a Bills logo, and because his neighbor was a big Jets fan, right? So all of a sudden, this guy paints the side of his house essentially that faces his neighbor, almost to taunt him as, "Hey, you know, I'm a Bills fan. You're you're my arch enemy here, the Jets fan in, in Rochester." York. Um, it got picked up on social media. I think Barstool Sports picked it up. We picked it up. We basically kind of tweeted at this guy and said, hey, we like your style. You know, if, if this gets enough um, you know, retweets and, and images and likes, um, we're going to give you a billboard to, to shout your message out. And basically it did in, in you know, no time flat. So we went from this one guy painting the side of his house with a Buffalo Bills logo to taunt his neighbor to we gave him a billboard outside of rochester on the highway massive as you google it you'll see it. it's so funny basically the billboard was a, a solid background that said hey hey i'm uh, forgetting the guy the, the neighbor's name but hey this is bill's mafia country you know love your neighbor essentially your next door neighbor um okay i think we even did like a, some you know out of home air banners after that really to take it to the next level yeah we did so we also did a newspaper drop and then we we got an aerial air banner to draw uh fly over the stadium and through rochester uh same type of creative so it was um i think it was a great example of taking like a digital social listening insight and then us reacting and planning and taking it to traditional media uh to really amplify it and get people talking about it so that it was super fun and um i think it was great yeah, I think yeah. we ended with a 15 second TV spot even, right? So it really started from grassroots, right. a guy's backyard, to all the way out of home, you know, a newspaper, and now culminates in this guy's got his own TV spot up in Rochester. Yeah, I think it ran in the uh, Jets uh, um, yeah. game. Yeah, there, was an there was another great example, I thought of that, that you guys shared, that I wasn't even kind of like, I didn't put two and two together, but I had seen you guys together with this whole Gardner Minshew, uh, Fitzmagic kind of connection with the stash versus the beard and talk a little bit about how that came together because I thought that was another one I mean here are two things like right at the beginning of NFL season just fa fabulous 
Yeah, another great example, I think, a result of really close partnership with sports teams, the media team, and our brand, our Pepsi brand team, and the great people on, on that team. Um, and again, it was born out of social listening. All of a sudden, you had the beard versus stash kind of, you know, uh, hashtag, you know, gaining steam, and we picked up on it. We were part, fortunate partners with both teams um, and, and really brought that to life on social media and made, you know, amplified a little contest out of it to, to really double down on that idea of who's going to win, the stash or the beard, which one is better. Um, and we kind of wrapped it up into a little social contest, which was the winning, you know, whoever won the beard or the stash, whatever team won the game, um, we were going to do that icon, either a beard icon, you know, a, a, um, kind of a clip art looking thing, either a beard or a mustache on a limited edition Pepsi bottle at the end of the season. And uh, the Dolphins won that game, so Fitzmagic won, so he's going to get a, a beard on, on Pepsi bottles. Um, but a really nice, fun way to bring a social listening idea to social amplify that way. And ultimately, we're all here to do at the end of the day, which is sell our products, um, you know, take it to retail. I'm curious on that front, on the social front, how do you guys evaluate and how do you, you know, I guess, first of all, I'd say, how do you get your ideation from your agency partners around that social aspect? How does that work? How does, you know, how do you kind of solicit ideas and make sure everybody's being heard so you kind of get the most out of your agency partners for something like that? That's a great, great point. I think that we usually brief with some with with four or five pieces of tension uh, within the fan base and we're in the NFL as a whole. Like, I think that the most recent thing we did, which was like boo the commissioner for the for the draft, it became like one that it came from social right. listening because we had this round table with all of our agency partners like every week. That's like what's trending in pop culture. And it was about two weeks before the draft when it was basically announced that there wouldn't be a physical draft. Um, you know, people were complaining about their chance of like, you know, the one of the best traditions is that when everybody moves the commissioner. Well, the thing for us will became was like that is something that we can maybe help fans do. Like we never take ourselves seriously enough. So we're, we're never going to be the Nikes or the Gatorades of the world where we're talking about performance. This is like yeah. a fun thing that we can help provide. So, you know, they we we brief that of like, hey, this is there. What can we do with it? Um, and, you know, our agency partners are across the board will have general above the line, we'll have a social digital agency, we have experiential, but they can all bring ideas. So the PR agency can bring an experiential idea and vice versa. There's no bad ideas. They all kind of come through the same form, but whatever the best ideas are that rise to the top, then we just go and execute them. And so for us, that the, all of a lot of the briefs we have are almost exclusively, especially when it lives in social and digital, are almost coming from social listening. Because when we do a brief from a traditional marketing campaign, it's coming off of who's the target consumer. It's going to live a lot longer at retail. The TVC, the retail elements take months to, to get ready. If you're going to drive that off of social conversation, that social conversation may be dead or completely pivot by the time that stuff hit mar hits market. But if you're doing it for digital content or activations or stunts like that, you can move quick enough. I mean, from the concept to actually pulling that off was 10 days. So like you couldn't do that at retail. You can, and that's the one good and the bad of things like that though, is like, the great part is through a great social conversation trended on draft night, like number two, like what everybody was talking about it. I can't translate it to retail because we move so fast. And I think that that is the one piece of of balancing out how we brief for long term 360 campaigns and how we brief to do be culturally relevant. So, because like what Justin and Katie has talked about, it's amazing that they can now take a, a campaign that they did with uh, Gardner Minshew and with, you know, Fitzmagic and basically a couple months later pay it off. That the good thing for us is that we're able to do that sometimes, but the alcohol industry is so regulated. It takes, you know, by the time we submit artwork and by the time like the alcohol board does it, we have, you know, so many hurdles that we've now limited what we do to be more realistic. And I think that that's actually helped us. Like there's no too big of an idea, but then when we go to execute that idea, what is it we need to do really well? Of just like small four or five tactics. When we start going to say, hey, we're going to turn this into a 360, it's like, let's stop for a second and like really realize what's the objective here. So so that I, I, that really segues into something I, I just popped in my head that I'm really curious about, Justin and Katie, and that's it. I see the way you two are so together and in sync talking about these things. You finish each other's sentences, which is really awesome. Um <laughs> I remember being in sports business, though, where we'd have two people that you know got along well like you, maybe not as good, but their agencies were always doing a little bit of that one-upmanship, you know, like, oh, we got the better idea. No, the media agency's got the better idea, and there was this competing interest. How does that work for you guys? How do you bring them together 
I know it's probably not perfect, even if you tell me it is, <laughs> but uh, that must be a challenge. And especially when you're talking about coordinating some of these tactics that fall really all the time into both things like social. So I'm just curious how that works for you. Ooh, can I start? <laughs> I think that the, the issue is honestly for us, John is like, it's not a perfect, right? we've got on roster probably 50 plus agencies across all of our brands. And, you know, but any given time, a single brand may have four or five agencies there. And the, the good and the bad of today's agency world is no agency is just one thing. So they all think they can do PR and they all think they can do experience. So like, you know, whenever an idea comes, you know, we may have an official AOR of who makes our t television commercials official for social digital and official for experiential. So the way at least we do it is great. The above the line team may bring a PR stunt, but our PR team is executing it because that is their expertise. And that's the way they were, that's what they were given. Same thing happens. Like we had a Super Bowl commercial a couple of years ago that came from our PR team. Why is Kennedy still shooting that thing? Because it's just that, like, we're we're we we put these people with expertise in place, but that brings the friction of like, well, it was our idea. I'm like, we know, but like, that's just why we have it. That's why you're still our PR company. And that's why you're still our experiential agency. It's tough. I mean, but it's just that hey, every time we do these RFPs for like or renewals, they're like, we also have these other things, and we're like, we know, but we have you because you're great at this, and that's a hard conversation. Yeah. I appreciate the candor. Uh, Katie, Justin? You want to take that one, Katie, or me? Yeah, I don't, whoever, Justin. You you want to take it, or I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I got me go ahead. I'd love to. So, uh, so the, I do think um, we struggle with, with the same situation, and it definitely varies by brand. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's always going to be an evolution and similar an idea can come from anywhere, right? And I would say, actually, these ideas didn't come from an agency. They came from our divisions, right? They they were locally, and then we took them and ran with them. So I think there's a lot of coordination, and there's a lot of work on the relationships. But similar, um, you know, we're going to make sure that it's executed by the folks that we hire to execute it, right? From a media perspective, it makes it a little easier because we only have one media agency for the most part. So we've worked hard to keep uh, different buying methods and uh, open of like, hey, Twitter, we're going to have an open I.O. It can come at any time. It might be 5,000. It might be 100,000. It might be nothing. Right. So we be, we have to be able to turn these things on and it's separate from your normal campaigns. Right. It's an, it's important that you separate these local social activations that may bubble up to be something bigger, but it's very different than running your your mass, you know, what you need to do to drive the business and your campaign. Um, so I do think it works similar. I will say that every brand is different and we have a ton of different agencies and, and some get along better than others. Um, but it's up to, I think, our internal folks to make sure that we're steering the right folks and making making sure that each agency is uh, is doing their best job on what they're capable of doing and what they're hired to do. Yeah, yeah John, I think the one part piece our CMO pre preaches all the time, too, is like, we don't ever want to be in a part where we're not allowing creativity to break through. So if we're sitting in a spot where we're just saying you're not allowed to present on that because that, that's not your expertise, like we may miss something. But so that's the one piece that we've gotten better at. And I think it's 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 good, but it's challenging. It's just. Yeah, I would say then the other challenge is we don't have too many ideas. Right. And then it's like, how do you figure out which idea to execute or not? Uh, and do you have enough resources to do so? So we're we're. We're always evolving our process and our evaluation and trying to figure out how to say this might be the one to do. This one's not the right one to do right now, but it's still a really good idea. It's just that we just don't have the bandwidth to do it because that's that's not easy either. Justin, anything you'd like to add? As usual, Katie uh, put it more eloquently than I could. But yeah, it's it's a, it's a, not a struggle, but it's just one of the dynamics we constantly deal with. And I think the better we get at managing it, the better ideas that you know, we, we bring to life and bring to market. So, yeah. Well, I can tell you today, guys, just just hearing uh, from the three of you um, and hearing, um, you know, the ways you work is really instructive for anybody who wants to be a partner with you, because I think it helps us really frame things much better. So as we kind of wrap up, you know, thank you for doing that. I did want to say one thing when I was when I was uh, getting ready to prepare for this, because I had so much time to prepare. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I was taking a look at, at Justin's uh, LinkedIn 
and I noticed he went to University of Michigan. And then I did a little research, and uh, the football in his background, there's a telltale sign. Um, he's actually making an announcement today that he's leaving Pepsi to take Jim Harbaugh's place. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Say that I broke the news. I'm the Adam <laughs> uh, Schefter of uh, Brand Innovators. So but I could serve true. that purpose. I, I think, uh, listen, I think Michigan's got a bright future, as I always do. I mean, it was <laughs> game, but, you know. <laughs> Listen, uh, it was uh, it was a, a real pleasure and an honor to to, to host this session. So thank you. Uh, thank thank, you. thank hey, you for having us. This is awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks again, John, Justin, Katie. You know, obviously, always great conversation when you can get these guys in the room. Um, you know, so from here, we're going to move on to uh, what we expect to be uh, another great panel. We've got uh, you know, you know what we saw earlier.